Let's please be standing as we sing to me of heaven. Sing to me of heaven, sing that song of peace from the soul. Good morning and welcome church. You know, um, the church, for me in many ways, is like a family. What well, is a family? You know, and, and, and in many ways, it's probably even more important and more dear to me than my biological family. Now, if you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you, and you can consider yourself a part of this family. We're glad you're here. Whatever the reason that causes you to visit, we're glad for that. I know in my travels, being able to go to worship with a local church family really you know, made me feel at home, so I hope you feel that way also. We really only ask <clears throat> excuse me, one thing of you, and if you'll look in the pew in front of you on the back, there is a little card, and we'd greatly appreciate you filling that out. So one, we'd have a record of your attendance, and, and two, we'd like to send you a little card acknowledging that you came to visit us. So before we enter into worship, let's have a brief prayer. Dearest Father, we thank you for the church. We thank you for this time to join together with fellow Christians to worship you and support each and to support each other. We pray that over the course of this worship time that we will do so in a manner that is pleasing to you and also lifts you up because you are indeed worth being lifted up. We pray that you would bless the endeavors of those who serve and bless each of the individual participants that they would come to have a greater appreciation and understanding of you for it's in jesus name that we pray amen this is holy ground Yeah. 
the rest of y'all, but <clears throat> I take a lot of gratitude in the fact that we have so many different people that lead song here, and they all have a different sound. And so, you know, no matter kind of what sound I want to hear, it seems like I hear multiple different ones, and is that a blessing, or I don't know. Maybe we should just say thank you a time or two to those folks that do that. But let's take a moment in prayer. <clears throat> Lord, as we come to you this morning, we just... First off, we'd like to take a moment to recognize who you are, to recognize that there once was nothing but you, and then you spoke. And no matter what process you use to create where we are today, we know it was your hand, it was your word that did the creating. Lord, may we take solace in that and may we recognize how great you are and how you are who you are, and only you. And there is no other God. Lord, we just take a moment to give you thanks for meeting our daily needs. And we take a moment to ask that you meet them. Whether it be a bill that we can't pay, or whether it be a medical struggle that we can't solve, we know that you have promised to give us wisdom, and you have promised to give us perspective. And this morning we come to you not double-minded, not wavering one way or the other, but this morning we ask that our heart and our mind be focused, and that we be clear, and that your wisdom be blessed on us. May we see every circumstance that we go through here on this world as only a blip in the great, great, great wonder that you have created for us in the end. Lord, we ask that that perspective be with us at all times. Lord, this morning we come to you and we ask that you would give us forgiveness for our sins. But at this time, we ask that our hearts be recognized that our sins are real and that when we tend to look at others and when we tend to elevate their sins above ours, we ask, Lord, that you would help us remove that plank from our eye before we even attempt to talk to our brother about the splendor in his. Lord, we come to you giving you thanks for Jesus. We ask that the songs that we sing, that they be lifted up, that your voice be pleased or your ears be pleased, and that our voices be loud, clear, and that the joyous heart be the goal, 
And if the melodic tone suffers, well, let the heart shine through. Let us sing anyway. Let us give praises to you. We ask for this country that we live in. We give you so much thanks for the wealth. But Lord, we ask that the wealth that we all live in, that it not be a distraction, that it not be the thing that keeps us from seeing you. So for that, we give thanks as well and ask that the leaders of our world find a way to seek your wisdom instead of man's. We give you thanks for the elders of this congregation. We know that they're going to be held to a standard. We thank you so much for their willingness to take that on. And we ask that we be a congregation that is easy to elder. May we not be the people who say they should do this, but may we be the people that say, what can I do to help? For it's in your son's name that we come to you and we ask these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I survey This time in our worship service, kind of ho hum, right? Well, it's not really supposed to be that, is it? The Lord's Supper was the center and core of their worship in the first century, and it ought to be the center and core of our worship in this century. When your children and your grandchildren ask you, What is this all about? What do you tell them? There's some great passages in the Bible. Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, I believe. But I've chosen Paul's remembrance of what he was taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 because it gives us a, an overview of what we're doing here today. <clears throat> he writes, For I received of the Lord what I also passed on to you, the Lord Jesus, on the night He was betrayed, took bread, and when He had given thanks, He broke it and said, This is My body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of Me. In the same way, after supper, He took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in My blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of Me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes again. The Lord's Supper is to remind us of what it cost for us to be saved. To remind us of what Jesus was willing to give and what God was willing to give in order that we might be His children. I've run across a few people who don't take the Lord's Supper, although we don't 
deny anybody that privilege. But they read verse 27 of this passage in 1 Corinthians 11. Therefore, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. And they say to themselves, I, I, I'm unworthy. I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm a sinner. And so they don't partake of the Lord's Supper. But that's not what he's talking about here. If sinlessness is what's required, none of us can take the Lord's Supper. But listen to what he said in verse 29. And he's explaining what unworthy manner means. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. There's the key and there's the core. As we partake of the Lord's Supper, we need to understand what it's all about and who it's all about and for who it is all about. We need to understand that this is a time to remember the most gracious gift ever given, the gift of Jesus Christ. And so as we prepare to take the communion, let's not forget why we're here and what it's all about. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for watching over us through the day, and thank you for blessing us with the privilege of being here today to praise and honor you and to glorify your name. Help us in the participation of this Lord's Supper to be lifted up and buoyed up and reminded again of how valuable we are to you, not to us, but to you. And we thank you, dear God, for this remembrance as we partake of this bread. Help us to do it in the in a manner that is appropriate for the day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. He from His head, His hands, His feet, sorrow and love The second Corinthian letter, chapter 5, Paul again reminds us of what Christ did. 
He says, for, for Christ's love compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And He died for all that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for Him who died for them and was raised again. There's your focus. A little bit later, two, two verses later, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And so we see what our task is. Not only to remind ourselves in this supper, but also in our lives to be what He wants us to be. He says, All this is from God who reconciled Himself to us through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them, and He has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. So as we think about this supper, we also think about what God, what task God has given to us to be reconcilers. And if you're a person who has encouraged someone else to be a Christian, you're a part of the reconciliation ministry. And so today as we partake of this fruit of the vine, let's remember it is that blood that this represents which makes us clean and holy and pure and righteous in God's sight. We pray. Almighty God, thank You for loving us. And thank You for caring for us. Thank You for being our God. And mostly, thank You for Your Son, Jesus. Help us, dear Father, to recognize His sacrifice, not only in this supper, but also in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Where the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small Oh, yeah.
were the whole realm of nature mine, that were a present far too small. Far too small a present to give back to God. I like the screen, blessed to be a blessing. That's one of the great themes of the Bible, especially the New Testament. Blessed to be a blessing. And so as we take the contribution today, let your heart guide you through it. And we pray that, that you'll, be a blessed, you'll be blessed by it as you always have been. Thank you for loving us, dear God. Thank you for blessing us with, with material things, and thank you for being our, our God. Help us, dear Father, to honor you and to bless your, your world and your church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Open my eyes that I may see glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hand the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set.
morning, church. Don't worry, it's not that bad. They're, they're all pretty short, short verses here. <laughs> when I first saw that, I kind of panicked, <laughs> but it's good. So um, I'll go ahead and start here. When pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. Pride only breeds quarrels, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. The fear of the Lord teaches a man wisdom, and humility comes before honor. Pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. A man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit gains honor. I almost lost my place. And the kids help. As they go across the street, would you all please stand? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. start this morning with a story that's been around for a long time. Uh, don't know if it's a, you'd call it a preacher story or one that's told for truth. Some even call uh, this story an urban legend. So uh, maybe it kind of started one way and kind of morphed into something else. But it's very illustrative of a sin problem, a mindset in this country which Satan is using for full advantage for his full advantage. He's using it to the full. He's having a field day with this one pervasive mindset. It's more pervasive and invasive than any pandemic. And it has a stranglehold on our lives today and how we deal with one another. You heard about it first. Before the story, I'll just say you heard about it just a moment ago, as well as a solution to it in the scriptures which Alan read to us from the wisdom of the Proverbs. But as followers of Jesus, we are called to have no part of this mindset we're going to talk about today. And so I'll bring up it up briefly and then the solution for this uh, as well. But first the story. A Navy warship was sailing through fog one night off the coastline when a distant light appeared ahead, directly ahead. As it grew brighter, the captain was called to the helm to assess the situation. And about the same time he came to 
do this, a voice came over the radio saying, to the vessel traveling 18 knots on a 220 heading, you need to adjust your course 30 degrees. And then the reply immediately came back, negative captain, adjust your course now. Uh, and let me back up. Um, the captain got on the radio and said, this is the vessel that's on the 220 heading. You adjust your course 30 degrees. And then a reply, negative captain, adjust your course now. At this point, increasingly annoyed, the captain replied, I am a U.S. Navy captain. To whom am I speaking? And the voice said, I'm an ensign in the U.S. Coast Guard. And the captain answered, then I suggest you alter your course. And he said, no, sir, I suggest you adjust yours immediately. And the captain said, son, we are a U.S. Navy warship. And the answer came back, well, sir, we are a lighthouse. I think you should change your course. So I, I know several of you have heard that somewhere in time before, but you hear the you hear the problem coming out in that, right? It's pride. We exhibit it when we are so focused on our perceived importance that we see ourselves as being bigger and more important than anyone or anything else. The reality is there are a lot of things bigger and more important than you and me. God and His will, for starters, and we could we could go on from there, but for a start, God and His will is bigger and more important. But this prideful heart and mindset of self-importance, this desire to impose our thinking on others, plus, and here's an added wrinkle that we have nowadays, plus the idea of making one's tribe consists solely of those who join with you in being against someone or something. You understand that's now how we affiliate with groups. We affiliate with someone who is against what we're against rather than someone who's for something, okay? So you add all that in the, in the, in the mix, and we have this mindset that is tearing our country apart bit by bit, and the world apart, really. It's universal. It's not just, it's not just something we see in our nation today. Pride is how Satan became the chief enemy of God and his people. It's at the core of everything he's about, and he's using it to great benefit today. This is, a, this is at the source of our, if you want to call them culture wars, our political wars, every other kind of war that's going on today. And if you hear certain sociologist-minded folks talk about this long enough, you get the the idea that there's this really, this very real fear that we may be heading towards in this nation some form of another kind of civil war. Okay, it's not going to be the kind where guys in two different color uniforms stand up in an open field and shoot at each other. It's not going to be that kind of conflict. It could be a whole lot worse. It could be a whole lot worse. Did you know that pride and its pursuit has spawned a cottage industry of its own today in the publishing business? Are you aware of this? That there are tons of books, I'm going to show you a few, just a few, but there are tons of books that are being written about this conflict that's going on right now in our country and in the world, what pride is doing in pulling us apart. I'll show you several of these. Um, Christians in the Age of Outrage. Uh, the Church of Us versus Them. What do, you, what do you already pick up a theme? It's, it's this. You know, it's all about winning, right? It's all about who's going to come out on top with the better argument or the stronger argument, or the more truthful argument, or the more valid argument. 
that's become what we're all about today, uh, at least in this, in this country. The third one literally is called Cold Civil War. Now, what's interesting is I own the first three that you've seen there. And, and by the way, um, there, there are a few of you in the room that uh, use my library, which uh, is bigger than I need it to be, actually. Much bigger, unfortunately. Uh, and, and any any time there's a resource that that I have uh, there, like I say, there's several that use my library as as an extension of their own, and that's fine. Uh, come and ask. Uh, you're welcome uh, to borrow some of these things. But what's funny is I own the first three, but it's this fourth one by Andy Stanley there that I'm most interested in, and really intend to get that. And once I finish some others, uh, read that one. Uh, not in it to win it. Don't you love that title? Not in it to win it. Why choosing sides sidelines the church? I love that title and the and the concept that he has behind. This is the probably the newest of the uh, four uh, that I've shown you there. And um, I wanted to look at his premise, which he writes here in, in this next slide about why he, why he wrote the book. Now, I disagree with him on one point here. He says, when the pandemic hit, the nation chose sides. Well, I'm sorry to tell you, Andy, it happened long before the pandemic. Now, what the pandemic did was it exacerbated an already bad situation. The pandemic made it much worse. But we were already starting to, to factionalize and, and divide and, and be at each other like this in conflict before the pandemic. But anyway, he says, when the pandemic hit, we chose sides. Unfortunately, so did the church. In doing so, we revealed that we truly, what we truly value is winning. Listen to his next statement. But our Savior did not come to win. He came to lose on purpose, for a purpose. He's dead on with that. It's time we fall in His footsteps and recognize we're not in it to win it, but we're here for something else entirely. The something else is what this book is all about. So he had me right at the, at the beginning of the, of the premise there. And he's not wrong in a lot of what he says there. We forget when we make it all about getting our viewpoint across, even if it is a more Christian stance, we forget that we're not going to make we're not going to win anyone for Christ by making them our enemy. You understand that? Truth is only valid truth if it's put out there in love. Amen? It's not now that didn't get enough amens, actually. Because us saying and understanding that we have with God's Word, we have truth, it means nothing if we don't come across in love with this truth. It's only going to drive people further away from truth. We need to, of all people, we need to understand that. We need to acknowledge that in how we approach uh, people. Pridefulness, though, and this desire to be one who ends up on the winning side of an argument, it's giving the Lord's church a black eye. And it has been now for some years. It's one thing, again, we, to know we have it, but to come across the right way with a gentle and humble spirit, that's something else. So there you have in the last couple of sentences the sin problem that we're bringing out today and the solution to this same problem. I want to switch gears for a moment, but it is it is relevant. I love oxymorons. I brought this up to you before. They're one of my favorite kind of words, pairing of words. Uh, I, I love them because they're entertaining, uh, and also they point out jarring contradictions, sometimes absurdities of our everyday lives. A number of years ago, Minister Ken Durham, who was at Pepperdine at that time, put out what he called the top ten list of American oxymorons. 
So some of these you've probably heard of, but they're, I, I think they're great. Um, here's his list. First one we've all heard of, jumbo shrimp, right? Uh, small crowd. Think about it. We had a small crowd today, huh? Here's a good one. Airline food. Now, I thought more would get that one. But anyway, um, working vacation. I've never figured that one out, right? If you're working, you're not on vacation. Okay, anyway. Uh, freezer burn. There's another one. Freezer burn. Think about it. It'll come to you later. Resonant aliens. Here's, here's one of my favorites. Clearly misunderstood. Clearly misunderstood. Again, you'll get it when you leave today. Uh, pretty ugly. Pretty ugly. And then his last two, I think, really, really hit the spot. I think they're the best of the bunch. Government organization. I knew that one would get you. And then the last one, Microsoft Works. Okay, now, if you don't have a computer or use one, that meant nothing. That just went over your head. But anyway, for the rest of us, we know what that's all about. But I named those today because the solution to the sin problem that we're talking about this morning is found in something I'm going to call downward mobility. And downward mobility to the people around us in the world who are not in Christ, they, they would call that an oxymoron. They would say, what? Downward mobility? Are you crazy? That, that, that makes no sense. You know, the way to get somewhere in this world is not downward mobility. It's all about upward mobility, which entails putting down and belittling and shaming those who are in your way, or in the case of what we're talking about, those who dare get in an argument with us and realize that we don't take any prisoners. You see, that's the world's thinking, having no problem whatsoever with pride and self-centeredness in direct opposition to what Jesus described to His disciples as, to, as what is to be their mindset as opposed to the world in which they found themselves. In Matthew 20, uh, 25 through 28, he names this. He called him to himself and he said, Whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. He, that's a full translation there of the word servant. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, unto, but to minister and give His life as a ransom for many. Jesus said, I tell you, with the world, it's all about upward mobility. The opposite is to rule your life and direct your path. If you want to be accepted in the Lord's economy, which should be the one that matters to all of us, after having talked to his fellow shepherds about this very subject, urging them not to lord it over the flock, the Apostle Peter, or in this case, Elder Peter, has this to say in 1 Peter 5, verses 5 uh, and 6, speaking to fellow elders. He says, Clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. We usually read, gives grace to the humble. And then the next verse, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand that He may lift you up in due time. I love that graphic too, by the way. That little bitty, brilliantly colored bug on top of all those huge stones. Makes the point pretty well. William Barclay has an interesting note concerning 
the clothing of humility that Peter mentions in verse 5. He speculates the use for the word uh, of the word for tie with a knot, which was close to a word for garment used as a slave's apron, indicates that Peter was probably remembering back to his Lord's example in John 13. You remember that story very well, where Jesus put on a towel as one would put on a slave's apron. And he did a task that only, only a household slave would do. No one with higher standing would do what Jesus did that night in the upper room when he washed his disciples' feet. The same word, incidentally, and you have to either love or hate this about the Greek language, they have so many, so many words that say so many different things with just, with just one word. So many shades of meaning with just one word. You can, you can either say that's great or that's, that's a terrible way to do a language, but that's how they do it. Uh, this word also can refer to a long stole-like garment, which, guess what, was worn as a symbol of honor or preeminence. To complete the picture, you have to have both these images together. Just as Jesus in His self-emptying put on the equivalent of a slave's apron, He also later took back and put on his garment of preeminence and referenced the fact that he was their Lord and Master after he took back his position at the table after washing their feet. And in the same way, our garment of humility will one day become the clothing of honor for us because that's the only way in which to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, to first be the least and servant of all. Of course, we always think of Philippians 2, 6 through 11, when we think of Jesus' self emptying mindset. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. I'm going to just skim this for a few seconds. You know what it says. Who, being in the very nature God, that word's important, nature did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature, same word, of a servant, but even though it's the same word in Greek, it had a different connotation there. Nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And then, of course, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And that's the reason, for that very reason, now God has exalted him to the highest place, given him the name above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. There's one thing we may overlook, even though as familiar as we are with that, uh, you know what they say, familiarity, Overfamiliarity kind of breeds contempt sometimes. Uh, this is the difference I've already pointed out to you between the meaning of the word nature in verse 6 and its meaning in verse 7. In verse 6, Paul is saying it is Jesus' continuing state to be God like, co eternal with the Father. In other words, he continued to possess God's nature even in His walk on earth. It's hard for us to understand that, but He was no less God on earth than when He was still in heaven with the Father. Verse 7 refers to outward function or role. It's so impressive to me the fact that this means Jesus self-emptying to become a humble servant left His nature as God still totally unaffected. He served even though he was still in one sense fully God. We'll never completely understand that, this side of eternity. But Jesus was the perfect God-man. Story from England, I think, illustrates this very well. And I, I, I hope here I don't have my dukes mis, mi, mixed up, but 
when, when the Duke of Windsor, and this goes back a, a good ways, now on his mother's death, the new king of England, when he was still the Prince of Wales, word has it that one day Charles left Buckingham Palace and went down into one of the nation's coal mines. I don't know, this may have been widely publicized at the time, to see for himself the conditions under which people worked in a very difficult and dangerous area of British industry. So this perfect illustration of what we're saying here about Jesus. As a member of the royal family, he was just as much a prince down in the mine as he was in the palace, was he not? He was still prince. So while his essential equality with royalty was unchanged, there was no longer an equality of experience. He had consented to enter experiences that would never have come to him if he stayed living in the luxuries of the palace. And that's what's crucial about Jesus' example. He willingly took on experiences he didn't have to as God out of love for us. That kind of action draws people to someone out of admiration. That action leads to that selfless someone eventually being exalted through the eyes of many. Paul says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus, though uh, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. 2 Corinthians 8. Jesus led the way in demonstrating this downward mobility, an entirely different power scheme or secret for success than what we find around us today. The world defines humility as weakness, and thus weakness. Jesus says the opposite is true. Humility can still come from a position of strength. I call to mind a, a quote, or, or this calls to my mind a quote that uh, I think at various times it's been credited to C.S. Lewis. I'm not sure about this. But it says, humble people don't think less of themselves. They just think about themselves less. Okay? That was Jesus' position. That honor came out of lowliness, obedience, self-renunciation, as opposed to self-recognition. That reminds the story of a, of a football coach. Apparently he was from the south, <clears throat> who was on vacation with his family up in Maine on one occasion. They walked into a movie theater and sat down, and a handful of people that were there started to applaud. And he thought, wow, this is great. I, I didn't realize I, I, I'm known even up here. And someone in the small crowd goes over to him and shakes his hand and says, thanks for coming. They won't start the movie for less than ten people. <clears throat> Sometimes as much as it hurts, we need, we need those reminders, right? We need those reminders that the world doesn't revolve around us. Uh, and that if we really want to succeed in Jesus' economy where it counts, it won't happen by flaunting who we are or what we've done or whether we have the right uh, position on a particular argument or whatever it might be, but rather by demonstrating a sense of self-forgetfulness and dependence on God. That's what the Lord meant by setting a little child down in front of the disciples when He found they were arguing about, guess what? Who was the greatest? He said, oh, 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 object lesson time, time out. So he puts a child in front of him. And he says, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of God. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And those in the world go, what? Now, especially in the Roman world, because children were like property. They were meaningless. They had no value. Jesus says, on the contrary, they're of the highest value. We have things so turned around in the economy of the world today. But as we follow Jesus in His path of downward mobility, we're also cultivating the fruit of the Spirit. We're making ourselves receptive to God's engrafted Word, acknowledging it as God's tool for molding and shaping our lives after His will. Well, the story of two brothers closes us out with a final picture. 
these brothers grew up together on a farm, their dad's farm. One of them went off to college. He earned a law degree, became a partner of a prestigious law firm in the state capital, while the other brother, you can imagine, stayed home, worked the family farm. One occasion when the lawyer was back home visiting, he kind of got contemplative and he said to his former brother, why haven't you gone out and made a name for yourself and to, to be able to hold your head up high in the world like me? And the farmer pointed and said, you see that field of wheat, brother? Look closely. Only the empty heads stand up. Those that are well filled always bow low. That's the story of a lifestyle Jesus would have us emulate as a prescription for what is ailing us in this world right now. A world that is being torn apart at odds always with each other because of pride, uh, self-assertiveness, the insistence on being right, on winning at all costs. Jesus has the prescription. It's a recognition that it's not about those who blow their horns or stretch their necks high to be recognized to win the day. Rather, the winners are those who willingly put themselves in places of quiet service or have a gentle and quiet spirit that bear fruit for God. In Jesus, the humble way is the highway, regardless of the world seeing that as an oxymoron. Remember Paul's words again from Corinthians. God chose the weak things to shame the strong, chose the lowly things, the despised things, things that are not, to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before Him. Let's make sure we're walking the path that God incarnate chose as He walked this earth. Understanding the first and best prescription for this world right now is downward mobility. That's the message. That's the invitation that we all would be composed of this heart and mindset that is ours in Christ Jesus and that we're empowered through Christ Jesus to be able to live and to be able to exhibit to the world. Let's make sure we're doing that this day and every day. Let's stand and sing together. <laughs> All to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence
Thank you, Joe. We appreciate that message. It's my honor today to uh, wish again for those of you that are visiting that your visit with us has been uplifting and you feel closer to the Lord after being here. We're honored that you're here today and, and are our guests. And thank you, and please come back and be with us every chance you get. We love having visitors. I just want to remind you of a couple of things this morning. Uh, one is the uh, Body of Christ Community Center service that uh, the dinner, uh, Charles mentioned to you last week that uh, there's going to be a banquet, a benefit banquet on October the 11th, and I believe we've bought two tables as, as that's a work that we support. And uh, there are some additional seats left if you'd like to attend. Those seats are paid for, and there's a sign-up sheet out in the foyer if you'd like to attend that. I wanted to ask you this morning to especially remember in your prayers are missionaries. They have a difficult work. The work is hard. And we need to be remembering them and being thankful to the Lord for their service. In line with that, uh, Jerry and Bonnie Schmidt are going to be going down to visit our missionaries at the end of the month. They're going to go and uh, see how the work is going find out how we can better help them and serve them. And I would ask that not only you pray for our missionaries, but pray for this trip for Jerry and Bonnie, for their safety, for God's blessings on them as they travel and as they work with our missionaries. And we're, we're thankful for them and, and that their willingness to do this to help and improve our mission work. As we wrap up our service today, would you join me as we pray? Fathers, we come before You this morning. We know that, Father, we are prideful people and we ask Your forgiveness. Father, we pray that uh, we might have a spirit of humility as we seek to serve those around about us. Father, our nation is prideful. We're at odds with one another. Father, we, we pray that we might have a revival in our nation, that our hearts might be turned toward You, that we might be congenial with one another as You would have us be. Father, we thank You for Jesus for His example of humility. Help us that that might be in our minds as we live our lives to serve You. And Father, we thank You for the blood that He shed to wash away our sins. And we thank You in His name. Amen. May God bless you in the week to come. Let's all be standing one more time. Two, three, four. Oh, yes, rock of ages, ages, I am trusting now, dear Lord, in Thee. When we tell my journeys in heaven, till Thy blessed face I see.